Welcome into the Ether, a podcast brought to you by ETHUB, the essential source for Ethereum information. Into the Ether features talks with prominent guests in the community, as well as weekly recaps of the ETHUB newsletter. Aave is quickly becoming one of my favorite DeFi protocols. And no, it's not because they produce the best memes in DeFi. Like other lending protocols on Ethereum, you can trustlessly earn interest on your crypto or take out a loan. However, they are pushing the envelope with unique features such as the new money Lego, Flash Loans. Flash Loans allow borrowing of collateral and repaying it in the same transaction. This opens up endless possibilities such as swapping out collateral on your Maker Vault, unique arbitrage opportunities on decentralized exchanges, and much more. Head over to Aave.com to check it out. Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Ether. Today, my guest is Chris Winfrey. Chris is the co-founder of Authorium, a recently launched smart wallet solution on Ethereum. Thanks for joining me, Chris. Thanks, Eric. Really excited to be on the show. Yeah, absolutely. This is a product I've been very excited about. I've been diving into tweeting about it a lot recently, so I'm glad to get you on the show. But kind of before we dive into, you know, what you and your team have been building, I know you've been around Ethereum for a while. You know, you live near me. We've met up at meetups before, but can you just kind of give us, you know, a background on yourself? Sure. Um, So I I first kind of got my intro to uh, crypto uh, shortly after I graduated um, back in 2014. Uh, and I ended up uh, living with some people that started the, the Michigan Bitcoin Club, and then they saw, started the College Crypto Network that turned into Blockchain Education Network, which is still around. Uh, and so they, they introduced me to Bitcoin and blockchain, and, and then we're talking about you know, these different uh, concepts like, like building land registries on blockchain and all these kind of uh, use cases that go beyond just transferring value back and forth. And, and so that's what got me really excited. Uh, and I was interested in building stuff on Bitcoin, um, but it, it, you know, it was pretty difficult. And, and then Ethereum came along, so that, that was like another big light bulb moment was seeing like, okay, you know, this is a programmable blockchain. Um, we can actually like, you know, build out these other use cases. What, you know, what are the different possibilities? And you know, that's kind of when I, I, I really dove in and started um, you know, obsessing over this stuff and got excited. And, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of how I got into it and, and have been, uh, you know, really involved ever since. Nice. Yeah, it definitely kind of traps you and the gravity strong and you can't get out once you start going down the, the rabbit hole. Is your background in computer science and development? Yeah, yeah. So I, I graduated in computer science. I was, I was doing a lot of iOS development early on. Um, and uh, yeah, up until I, I started switched over to uh, smart contract development. Gotcha, gotcha. And I, I know, you know, even before you got to Ethereum, ever since you've learned about Ethereum, you've been involved in a couple of different projects and teams and ideas. Do you want to just kind of tell us what your journey has been, you know, since first hearing about Ethereum to today? Sure. So so at one point I, I moved to Boston um, and I was looking for a crypto job. There, there wasn't much out there. Um, Circle is pretty much the only company in Boston outside of like some uh, Bitcoin ATMs. Uh, and they, they were still pretty small too. And, and so I ended up joining up with some X circle engineers that started, uh, just a regular, um, like digital agency. And, and, and I was doing some iOS development with them for a while. Uh, and, and then just doing smart contract development and, and watching, you know, Ethereum progress, uh, while, while doing that stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I was always like really interested in, in you know, like wanted to do that full time. And, and, you know, the second, you know, I saw it starting to get some traction, that was kind of my focus. Um, and they, they weren't interested in, in doing any kind of Ethereum related stuff at the agency. So I, I ended up leaving uh, and I, I started the Boston Ethereum developer meetup, um, which, which is still going on today. And then uh, co-founded a Ethereum dev shop called Level K. And so, you know, we, we started uh, building Ethereum applications for different companies in Boston. Um, Gnosis was actually one of our, our first clients outside of Boston. I met, I met Martin and Stefan out uh, in Cancun before DevCon and, uh, because we were interested in building insurance with prediction markets. And, but that kind of kicked off a conversation and we ended up doing some work on, on Futarchy with them. Uh, and then, you know, I ended up working with a ton of cool teams 
uh, all around the world. And, and then at, at some point we started uh, auditing. We, we kept getting requests to audit, but we had always turned them down because that wasn't our focus. And at some point, a team was just, you know, told us like, hey, you guys will do great. Will you just audit it? And um, so we did. And, and you know, we, we got great feedback uh, and, and uh, started auditing more projects. We ended up auditing like the Open Zeppelin framework. Um, and then we, we started working, you know, they, they liked uh, the job that we did. So we started working closely with their team on different audits and ended up working on, you know, Augur and DYDX, Trust Token, Decentraland, and, and a handful of others. And so that, that kind of uh, transition to, you know, my focus at Level K was, was on the, the auditing side. Um, and then, you know, I moved out to LA, you know, still with Level K, and I, I met my current co-founders, uh, Shane and Miguel. And, um, you know, Shane was really, you know, really, really involved in the auditing as well. And, and uh, you know, so, so you know, we, we grew that piece of, of the company out. And then, you know, Miguel was working on another project, uh, you know, another startup, and then, you know, did some contracting work here and there with Level K. Uh, and then at, at some point we decided, uh, you know, we, we were interested in smart contract uh, accounts and, and um, kind of saw an opportunity there. So we decided to spin the auditing um, piece of the business out and uh, we started Authorium and kind of used the auditing business to uh, bootstrap ourselves and, and have some revenue early on um, before we had any funding. Nice, nice. Yeah, so your experience is vast across a lot of different projects in Ethereum. It, it's kind of weird, too. We actually have the same path as far as journey across the country goes. We were living in Boston around the same time and moved to LA, I think, around the same time, too. So I, I think it's a great background on yourself and you know what you've been involved in. And you mentioned at the end there now, obviously, I want to focus on talking about Ethereum. It was recently launched. Um, can you first start, though, with kind of where did the idea of Ethereum come about or originate? What was like your aha moment of you know why we should build this? And then can you kind of walk us through just at a high level exactly what it is? So I, I think it was uh, James Young who first uh, got me excited about contract-based accounts, and, and so I think he was also a previous guest on your show. Yeah, yeah, one of my one of my favorite episodes, actually. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy, and uh, you know, so I, I was really in, into uh, layer two solutions at the time, and, and specifically state channels, and uh, I, I was hoping we could do some stuff with level K, or yeah, with level K uh, with layer two. Um, and, and I knew James had had some experience with that. So, you know, I just started talking to James every week about, you know, different layer two ideas and, and what could be done and, and any like grant opportunities. And, and so, and then he started talking about, uh, contract based accounts and, you know, Nosa safe was out at the time. I, I think that was before, um, you got involved, but, um, yeah. Uh, you know, so I was kind of watching what was happening there. And, and then also, you know, listening, you know, Alex Van Sand had been talking about uh, universal login. And so that that was a big inspiration as well. Um, and yeah, so it, it just really seemed like uh, contract based accounts were the, the way things were headed and, and uh, that there was, you know, now just kind of like opened up this this large design space in terms of uh, like what you could build with with uh, you know a wallet and and so that's what I was really excited about and um, started to kind of think about the possibilities and and one of the things I was most excited about was the portability of of a contract based account and and the fact that you could um, not have it attached to an application but you could just kind of like log in on multiple devices and have that like more you know familiar experience for users. Yeah, that that's definitely the one of the biggest pluses, I think. And I, I do want to dive into that. But I think before we go there, um, you know, people listening, I, I think most people are, most people probably heard of smart contract accounts. If they're listening to this show, I know I talk about them a lot. So if they've listened to any previous episodes, they definitely heard about it. But I think it's important to kind of like explain, you know, how do they differ from other wallet solutions that are out there, right? Like, I think a lot of people are used to hardware wallets, they're used to MetaMask, you know, kind of what are the core differences between these different wallet types that are out there and kind of where where does Ethereum differ from those? Yeah, so so with a smart contract wallet, um, you hold all of your funds in the smart contract rather than just with a private key that has full control over your funds. 
Um, and then you give uh, you know different keys access uh, to the smart contract. Um, and but it, you know in most architectures these uh, keys that have access to the smart contract don't hold any kind of funds, so they can't actually make transactions. Um, so those keys are used to sign uh, data, and then that. Uh, transaction data is passed off um, to a relayer, and then the relayer makes the transaction uh, in what you know that whole system is called a meta transaction. Um, and, and so that's kind of li like so rather than a traditional account where you sign your transaction and broadcast it uh, with a contract based account, you hold your funds in a smart contract, and then you you uh, give keys access uh, to the account, and then those keys. Um, make transactions through meta transactions yeah which obviously all that opens up a lot of opportunities for features and you know you you talked about one of the things you got most excited about early on was this idea of portability right so not having an extension tied kind of like logging in anywhere that's my personal favorite feature of this do you want to just kind of talk us through like what does the sign up and sign in workflow look like for our theorem? I mean, I, you know, a lot of people are used to MetaMask where you launch MetaMask, it makes you back up a seed phrase, you know, you have to be on that browser or have your seed phrase to import it somewhere else. Can you kind of talk about where Ethereum differs there? Yeah, definitely. So, so just to take a step back, so Ethereum is a wallet and a login solution. Um, so we, we both, you know, allow users to manage their funds and then also allow users to um, sign up uh, for a wallet and, and then uh, use that wallet to log into a decentralized application um, to use their funds with that application. Um, and so the sign up flow for Ethereum, you just create a username and password um, and then enter your email, which is used um, for you know just basic notifications and things. Um, and you hit create account and then you have an account and you're ready to go. So kind of behind the scenes then, what's happening? Is this account somehow being tied? Obviously, you know, a smart contract's being deployed and is there a seed phrase involved here? Kind of like how is this all being tied together during the creation process? Yeah, so, so um, this is something we gave a lot of thought to early on because um, two of our core values are being one, non-custodial. Um, so we can never access the user's funds and only the user can access their funds. And then two, uh, censorship resistance. So we want to make sure that users can always uh, get to their funds and that Ethereum as a company can stop existing uh, and the you know, user won't lose access to their funds. Um, and so you know, decentralization is talked about a lot in the Ethereum space. And, and we kind of see you know, there's, there is an opportunity for you know, a company to provide these convenient, convenience features, but you know, those two values are very, very important to like the core ethos of, of Ethereum and are, are, you know, two of the big selling points and, and two things that we're not willing to compromise on. So to stay true to the, those core values, what, you know, the way uh, things work is, uh, you know, when the user signs up, uh, a key that, that um, is kind of their main key that accesses their account is generated on the client side um, and then encrypted with, with their password. Uh, and then we also uh, deploy a smart contract that is a able to be accessed by that key, uh, and but we never actually see the key. You know, it, it, it's encrypted, uh, and we just know the public address. And then once that account's deployed, only that key can access the account. Um, and then we also uh, connect that account to an ENS name. So every user that signs up for Ethereum has an ENS name so that they can easily send funds from, you know, different applications uh, without having to, you know, copy and paste a, a, you know, a hex string or an address uh, or like scan a QR code or anything that, that's kind of a clunky user experience. Yeah, I, I was one of the early ones to sign up and I snagged eric.auth.eat. I, I think this is going to be big, so hopefully that's a nice username someday. <laughs> um, one question for you, like right now, you know, I go to ethereum.com, I access my wallet. You said this is non-custodial and like I could access funds if I needed to even be on the website. Like what, what happens if, you know, you guys disappear, ethereum.com goes down tomorrow? You know, what is kind of the backup plan for me as an Ethereum user to access my wallet? Yeah, so... so um, we, we have a lot of plans for, for making this really easy. Um, today, you know, we're, we're still in beta, so today it's more of a manual process. Uh, you can back up your, your um, private key or your encrypted key store. 
Uh, and then, you know, you can use that, that key to access your, your wallet at any time. Um, and that can be done through, you know, different like applications like, like Remix or Etherscan today. But um, what we're working on and, and is one of our goals before going out of beta is, is releasing a version of the Ethereum front end that doesn't touch any third party services, including, uh, you know, the ones provided by us. Um, and so this will be something that, you know, kind of like with my crypto or, or different applications where, they, where you can download uh, the front end locally so that you know that you have a secure copy. Um, the, it, it'll be like that where, where you can, you know, one, you could run the version that's hosted on IPFS or you could keep a local version um, just in case. And at any time you can, uh, you know, run th this uh uh, front end and, and uh, import your encrypted key store or private key that you have backed up or, you know, your seed phrase or use uh, one of the accounts that you set up as a recovery device and then um, start uh, creating transactions or, or uh, doing, you know, interacting with your contract based account without needing a relay or without needing any kind of uh, third party services. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite thing just by far about this is, I mean, like I, I have a Gnosis Save multisig using like the new interface, and you guys are integrated in that. And like I can, I did it the other day. I just loaded up Safari iOS on my phone when I was on the go, and just click Ethereum for login, type in a username and password, I have my two FA set up for it, and all of a sudden you're just connected to Ethereum, right? That's such a better user experience. Yeah, I mean, th thanks, and and it's something we we've given put a lot of effort into, and uh, hoping we we see more of that in the Ethereum space. Yeah, for sure. I, what are your thoughts on like, I mean, not to like go talk about MetaMask specifically, but just this concept of like a browser extension, like, you know, MetaMask has done a lot of good. It's got us to where we are in the space. Do you, do you think it's more of just like this niche user group that's used to it? Anytime I show someone Ethereum and like try to watch them go through a transaction, they always get hung up on like the gas screen on MetaMask, right? Do you, do you think, I mean, obviously you're somewhat biased in this, you're building a solution that, you know, is, is setting this up to be different, but what are your takes on like future adoption and browser experiences or browser extensions and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we don't have anything against browser extensions, but I, I do think, you know, what like early on with Ethereum, our, our focus was really on, on onboarding user experience. Um, you know, and, and right now we're focused on user experience in general as well as onboarding. Um, but we saw like three of the biggest hangups for onboarding were one, asking a user to download something, you know, whether that's an extension or like a crypto browser or something like that mm -hmm. um, is a big hurdle. And then two was uh, asking them to write down and store a seed phrase because um, that's kind of scary or, you know, you need a secure place um, to write it down and then to store it. Um, and then the third was acquiring crypto, it, it, just because it often required uh, like a KYC process that could sometimes take a few days um, and then also require the user like breaking out their credit card or, you know, bank account before they've actually realized any value from the application. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in, in terms of the future, we, we hope to see, uh, you know, I, I think you know, like you said, like we wouldn't be anywhere with, without MetaMask. You know, they, they've done a lot for the space and uh, like definitely, you know, played a big role in, in any adoption that, that, that we've gotten so far. Um, but, you know, I, I would love to see more and more solutions and more and more applications that that just put less of a burden on the user and and, and show them like what what's great about Ethereum and, and the value they can get from Ethereum before uh, asking them to, you know, make these difficult steps like like downloading something or uh, yeah, backing up a seed phrase, getting crypto, et cetera. Yeah, breaking down those barriers and like abstracting that poor user experience away is going to be huge. I want to take a second to talk about our sponsor, Real T. Realty tokenizes rent producing real estate properties as ERC twenties and allows Ethereum users to invest in them. By owning a share in one of the properties, you have a right to part of the monthly rent payment, which is paid out every 24 hours and die. My favorite part about this project is that it's in their vision to integrate these tokens into DeFi apps on Ethereum. And the first property that's sold, you could actually trade them on Uniswap, which is really cool. The current return on most properties is between 10 to 13 percent a year. Head over to realty.co to check them out. 
I think that's a good transition into, I want to talk about, you know, because it's a smart contract underneath, like what that enables Ethereum to do uniquely versus maybe some other wallets that aren't smart contract wallets out there. I think, you know, first I want to start with fees. You just mentioned, you know, requiring someone to have crypto before they interact with Ethereum is a, is a big hurdle. I totally agree with that. Um, you guys can do a couple unique things with fees. Do you want to just, you know, walk us through kind of your approach to it at this point in time? Sure. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about meta transactions and, and um, because uh, smart contract based accounts use meta transactions, it opens up uh, kind of how we think about uh, transaction fees and the different things we can do with transaction fees. And so one thing um, that we were really excited about early on and, and implemented was allowing users and, and, and so did uh, Gnosis Safe uh, before us, I believe. Uh, was allowing users to pay for transaction fees uh, with ERC-20 tokens. Um, and that was great because a lot of applications require a specific uh, ERC-20 token, but uh, in order for the user to use the application, they also needed ETH if they were using just an externally owned account. Uh, and, and so by uh, kind of abstracting away the token that you need, then the user can just use whatever token that they're using on the application. So if it's a DAI based application, they can just use DAI also to pay for their transaction fees. And then, you know, we ended up taking that a step further before launch and um, just covering the transaction uh, fees for users. Um, and, and so this is something that, you know, I want to dive into and, and talk about because obviously this is a, a big cost for us. and and. Uh, like, you know, it, it's our, we think that it does like dramatically improve the user experience. Um, and, and because of that, we want to make sure that we can do this in a sustainable way. And, and so we, we have some plans for, um, making that happen. Yeah. So I definitely, I do want to dive into that. And actually this is something you and I, I guess have had, I guess I'll call them some small brainstorming sessions in the past, a few weeks ago on telegram, like before you guys were launching, you and I were talking about how, or you were explaining how you guys were going to approach fees. So I guess I want to just kind of take some of those questions I had asked you at the time and learning your approach here. Um, you know, we kind of see different ways about this, like Arjun is paying them on the Gnosis safe. We don't pay them. You know, there's questions around like, can you be Sybil attacked? Because you can't like, someone could just launch, you know, a thousand Ethereum accounts and just drain you guys of fees. Um, so, you know, what is your approach to that right now and kind of longer term plans as well? Yeah. And, and so um, just to take a step back, like, like you know, as we're thinking about our, our uh, transaction fee model and, and uh, like how that will work, you know, we, we have some like high level goals. And, and so uh, one of those goals is, is one, like for, you know, like we were saying, for, for new users, uh, allowing users to get onboarded, start using Ethereum applications. Maybe it's like they, they join a game and, and they get a free pack of NFT cards and, and can start like trading those without having to acquire any crypto first. Um, so the, that is kind of one experience that, that we want to uh, keep and, and make sure that, that free transactions are there for that type of user. Um, and then two, it's we don't want to uh, price out any application. So we don't want to uh, like, like basically force all uh, dApps to pay for their users' transactions and then it, in turn like, like price out, uh, you know, any dApp that, that doesn't necessarily have a strong business model or any business model, or maybe doesn't even have like uh, organization, you know, traditional organization with a budget backing it. Maybe it's just like exists for the public good. Um, so we don't want to price those out. And then, um, yeah, and then, you know, making sure that we can do that in a sustainable way so that we can keep, you know, building out Ethereum and, and working on these different UX problems and, uh, you know, actually be a sustainable com uh, company. Um, and so what we kind of landed on, and, and this is still in flux, and, and so like it could uh, change by the time we release it, but we, we do hope to get it out in the near term is um, on the DAP side, we want to have a, a free tier and a, a paid tier. Um, and so the free tier is, you know, allows all DAPs that want to support Ethereum to support Ethereum. Users can still access free transactions on those DAPs, um, but in a limited way. And then on the user side, we want to uh, put, you know, it, one of the reasons we just launched with free transactions was because we didn't have all the data that we needed to create this model. 
And so by uh, launching that, the, the launching Ethereum and starting to see how users use uh, different dApps and, and uh, like, like, you know, what kind of transactions they're making, how much those transactions are cost and everything has really um, given us a lot of data to base this model on. And, and so what we want to do is put the limits in place so that, you know, we cover the, you know, 90% of, of users, um, we're covering, you know, 90% of, of transactions, and, and then just putting the limits in place to eliminate kind of like the long tail of, of really expensive transactions, and then also long tail of like very, very heavy uh, users. And so what this will probably look like is, is a certain number of transactions that are, are free for the user, like per week or per month. Um, and then those transactions will, will have a, um, like a gas limit cap um, that will, you know, because we've kind of abstracted gas away as much as possible in the user experience, we'll, we'll surface that in kind of a user friendly way. Um, and that gas limit cap will be set at a point where it covers like the vast majority of regular transactions, but does uh, likely cut out the long tail of like very expensive transactions. So, so things like uh, DEX aggregator trades that or the heavier DEX aggregator trades or like heavy contract deployments. Um, and in those cases, the user can still uh, choose to pay for their transaction. It's just not covered under the kind of free, uh, tr you know, the, the X number of free transactions uh, per week, per month. Um, but then on the, the DAP side, uh, if the DAP uh, chooses to go with the paid tier, then they, they will cover uh, the cost of, of transactions for their users and they can put in their own limits in place if they choose. Um, but in that case, you know, from the conversations we've had w with uh, different dApps, like the, it's such a better user experience um, for and, and will you know drive more traffic for the dApp. And you know, so if the the uh, you know Ethereum application has any business model at all for itself, it almost always makes sense for them to to cover these costs for users and and uh, you know for the sake of of you know the better user experience and higher traffic that they're they're going to get because of that. And so when, when a user is using one of those applications, they don't need to worry about like the, the you know, X number of transactions uh, or, you know, they can just use it as many transactions as they want. Uh, and um, in that way, uh, we can kind of like serve, serve both sides and, and not price anyone out. Yeah, so, so I just wanted to touch on the last thing you mentioned, which was uh, civil protection. And, and so like right now we have some, some measures in place uh, for civil protection. Uh, it's something that we're watching closely, um, and you know we we have other things that we can add, uh, and and that's one of those things where you're kind of balancing like how much do we protect the you know uh, like our our costs versus uh, you know like allowing for a good user experience. So it's something that we're watching carefully, and and if we see uh, you know signs of abuse, we have measures that we can take to basically increase our, our civil resistance and, and and for any like less technical users civil resistance or a civil attack is when a single person or single entity makes many many accounts and uh in order you know where, where civil resistance is is making sure that you know there's one user per uh account or one person per account yeah yeah, so theoretically, I mean, even if you had limits on a per account basis, someone could spin up, you know, in an extreme case, you know, 100,000 accounts and try to drain funds. But um, it's good to hear you guys have some measures in place there. And there's stuff you can do, like Argent uses phone numbers. And, you know, there's definitely ways forward. I think your approach is right, like launch and kind of see what users are doing and then kind of analyze it and go from there. The, the DAP approach is interesting. So basically, if I'm understanding correctly, and I'm just using a random DAP here, uh, but like a DYDX, right who recently announced that they're going to take some fees on trading like they're going to start making money they might say hey you know whenever you go to their site and you log in with a wallet under Ethereum, it might say hey if you use Ethereum, fees are free because we're paying for them is that right yeah exactly so so like one of our our launch partners uh erasure which, which is live now and, and it's a, a data marketplace where you can basically put up bounties for for data um they like transactions will always be completely free on Erasure um, because, you know, they, they cover it on their side and, and uh, have a model to kind of 
make up for the transaction cost, which is actually fairly low for their application. Yeah. You guys must have had a fun day, what, five, six days ago when the network fees were averaging like 180 gui per transaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that's um, the another uh, form of limitation that we're talking about is is so like you know we that last week was pretty crazy. We we haven't seen a day that crazy in a long time, or probably if ever. But we have seen crazy days, especially when people were launching ICOs, or in, I think when when Tether came on to Ethereum, um, but. We, we want to introduce some concept of, of, you know, we think about it like surge pricing uh, with something like Uber, uh, where we basically want to discourage uh, some transactions when the network is congested, just, you know, like the, that, that's like kind of the point of the, uh, the current fee model in, in Ethereum is, is like, you know, drive the price up to, to kind of like limit um, transaction volume. And so by, by, you know, either passing on, you know, like, like removing free transactions for, you know, when, when the network is extremely congested or, uh, you know, with the option that the user can pay for them to go through or allowing users to still make transactions, but, but letting them know that um, they'll be mined over like a 24 hour period or, or like, you know, maybe a few hours um, to, to, yeah, make sure that we're not incurring like extreme costs during um high network congestion yeah yeah i mean i'm, I'm glad you guys are tackling this I, I do think a lot of this should be done on the wallet side obviously having a smart contract and relaying fees helps you guys accomplish this but i i think yeah, i've beaten this dead horse so many times but I, I think the current fee market is the biggest hurdle to ethereum mass adoption i don't think people want to under they don't want to understand it they don't you know they don't know what's going on you send a transaction it's stuck they don't know why like this is this is a problem that you know i'm glad to hear you're tackling because it makes sense to me kind of on the wallet side to kind of funnel these properly and like guide the user a little bit when it comes to this i totally agree and and yeah just the the to to an end user especially if they don't understand ethereum like the fact that they have to like the whole concept that they need to figure out a gas price and balance like their transaction either you know possibly getting stuck or having to like pay twice as much for their transaction fee to make sure it goes fast it it, it just like is such a uh, a crazy and seemingly unnecessary hurdle um so yeah, I, I, I like the work that that you've kind of pushed on that end too. I, I I think those are all great ideas, and you know would love to see that get get worked in at the protocol level. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, EIP one five five nine. I I hope it picks up enough steam. It's going to be an ETH two. It sounds like by default, but I'd still like to see it on ETH one. I think we got some time to go still on ETH one. Actually, you wrote a blog post I read a year. I guess it was over a year now about gas spectrum pricing. That was one thing that fascinated me. Is that are you still exploring that solution at all? Yeah, I mean, so we basically do it um, with Ethereum because we automatically uh, speed up transactions um, or, or will really soon. We actually um, don't have it enabled quite yet. Um, but the idea with, with the gas spectrum transactions was a way to abstract a gas away for like any type of wallet. So it works for externally owned wallets uh, as well. And so, so the reason we're not quite doing gas spectrum transactions right now is because we're covering the transaction fee. Um, so we don't, uh, so to take a step back, the, the idea is that instead of a user uh, signing a single transaction, they can sign like a, a series of transactions or a spectrum of transactions where the gas prices range from like the market gas price and then slowly ramps that up. And then what a wallet can do with these series of transactions is first broadcast uh, the market rate one, but then in case that that, uh, that transaction is not getting uh, mined, the application can automatically start uh, ramping up the gas price because they already have the signed transaction from the user. Um, so that to kind of guarantee that the, the transaction either will get mined unless it reaches some like maximum gas price and still can't get mined. And the reason that's safe is because the whole series of transactions all shares a single nonce. So it's only possible for one uh, transaction in the series to ever get mined. Um, and so that's something that could be used by like MetaMask or, you know, basically any wallet out there today. So love to see it get more adoption. 
Um, but in our case, since, since the, the, you know, we're paying for the transaction fees, we can, and we're using meta transactions, we can automatically ramp up the gas price uh, regardless of what gas price the users signed because it doesn't matter to us if we use a higher gas price and don't get a refund for it because we're not taking a, a refund anyway. Uh, once we introduce these uh, limitations that we talked about, uh, then then we'll definitely be introducing uh, gas spectrum transactions so that like in the case where the user is outside of their free transaction limits and they're paying for the transaction, we can still do this automatic speed up um, to make sure that they don't have to think about stuck transactions. Yeah, that's nice. Anything here is going to help and go a long way. So I'm excited to see people actually focusing on it for once. That, that That's exciting. I, you know, we've talked a lot about user experience and gas and, you know, the user experience behind that, which I definitely think are the most important things for a wallet right now. But there's obviously a pretty much an endless list of features that, you know, having a smart contract wallet can enable. And I know that you guys have some unique recovery options in there. Can you kind of just talk about the current approach to recovery and, you know, what you're thinking about here? Yeah, so so you know we're actually um, rolling out some recovery stuff right now, and, and so um, currently you can add different recovery devices to your Ethereum account, or you can um, back up a seed phrase that would uh, you know give you access to your uh, original uh, we call them an admin key, but the main key that accesses your account. Um, and then we're starting to think about um, like more in depth recovery features, or actually starting to work on them. Um, and so one of the big things that we're seeing is uh, we don't want to force the user to add a recovery method um, right out the gate, you know, especially like right when they're signing up. Um, but at the same time, we don't want a user, because we can't access their accounts, um, we also can't allow users to basically recover a password because uh, we don't know the password and the password is the only thing that uh, can decrypt the encrypted key store that, that the user needs to access to access their account. Um, so we don't want users to who forget their password to basically lose access to their account um, before they add recovery. So we're adding one, a recovery module that will allow uh, the addition of recovery uh, accounts that are on a time delay. Um, and actually, uh, it was Stefan George from Gnosis who I first heard talking about this type of recovery. Uh, I don't know if, if it was originally his idea, um, but uh, the, the idea is like uh, allow this account to trigger a recovery process. But then if, if you still have control of your account, you can cancel that recovery process at any time. And so by doing that, you can basically add recovery accounts without making them custodians of the account. And so what we'd like to offer is, is an Ethereum uh, recovery method that we provide as a service. And so that when a user makes an account, they are first are, you know, it, it's, it would be like an opt out thing uh, where they uh, have the Ethereum recovery module uh, you know, or, you know, method uh, enabled so that if they do forget their password before they add a recovery method, their account's not lost. But then once they add their own recovery method, the Ethereum recovery methods are removed and then they, you know, uh, are, you know, completely responsible for their account at that point. Um, so that that's kind of one thing, one step that we're taking um, to protect users who are, you know, just gotten onboarded uh, and haven't added their own recovery method. But we still are going to push users heavily to add their own recovery method and, and remove the Ethereum one. And then also, yeah, exploring social recovery and, and ways to, you know, add different accounts and, and different combinations of accounts to do a social recovery of an account. Yeah, all that's huge. I mean, there's still, this day and age, there's no reason someone should be writing down and worried about losing a seed phrase, in my opinion, right? We have all these tools at our hand to build better solutions. And I, I think these recovery options, like I think the user experience and gas will, um, you know, just be a nice to have for new users coming on, like things they're excited for. But I think better recovery and making people feel comfortable that they don't have to worry about a seed phrase, they can trust their family or friends or like this other account to fall back into. I think that'll give people more comfort than anything about using crypto. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree. Yeah.
So, you know, kind of on that point and, you know, making people feel comfortable using crypto, I mean, and this is a problem we run into every day at Gnosis with the Gnosis Safe too. And, you know, it kind of all started with the parity multi-sig hack and just kind of the stigma that created around smart contract wallets. There's still definitely this, you know, idea out there that storing funds in a smart contract wallet is not safe, right? And you, you can't really blame people because of kind of the hacks that have happened. And, you know, we're still early in all of this and stuff like that. You know, what's your opinion on how do we get people to trust smart contract wallets more? Yeah. And, and so, like, I think that's definitely valid. Um, you know, we, we actually had a, a vulnerability disclosed to us um, shortly after we launched um, that we had to patch um by sam zz son he's found like loads of vulnerabilities in all kinds of projects a uh, ton of respect for the the work he's done and uh you know and i i think it's a valid concern when you're using any smart contract especially uh it's you know especially if it's a smart contract that's holding your funds and not one that you're just uh doing like a one-off interaction with and you know i i think one is is you know security the, the smart contracts become, I don't want to say become more secure, but they, they are, uh, we realize that they're more secure over time. Like the longer they've been around and not gotten hacked, the more we can trust them. Um, and then, so, so I, I think, you know, as smart contract accounts have been around for longer and, you know, the patterns become uh, more standardized and, and, you know, more trusted and uh, have had more eyes on them, you know, the, the trust and contract based accounts will just by by you know will just naturally grow and and uh on the other side like i think yes that, that you know there are those additional risks when you're when you're interacting with the smart contract but then also there there's these nice security uh features that we can add that are only possible with contract based accounts and so you know with the externally owned account your your private key basically has full control over your funds and with a smart contract based account, what we can do is, is uh, authorize these uh, keys that are specific to certain applications. And then we can, um, you know, put uh, the, you know, scope these keys so that they can only interact with specific contracts. They can only access limited amounts of funds. They have expiration times and, um, and, and can be invalidated and, and stuff like that. Um, that really does add to the, the security side of things that just aren't possible with uh, externally owned accounts. Um, so I, I think like once those kind of features start to mature and, 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 and become a reality um, and, and like as uh, contract based accounts um, like, you know, Nosa Safe and our contracts and Arjun's contracts have been like around for longer and longer and, and have gotten more and more eyes on them. Uh, you know, and, and aren't being, you know, changed and uh, have gotten more audits and, and you know, they have had long lasting bug bounties, you know, will like the, the perception of, of contract based accounts will, you know, be more and more trusted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I always wonder even for like, you know, the basic user that's not very good at OPSEC around their private key like you know arguably that's maybe more of a risk than the smart contract getting hacked and drained right so th there definitely is like a trade-off I, I think we need to just you know I'm not saying everyone rush out and go through all your funds in a, in a smart contract wall that's not what I'm saying but I do think there's going to be this tipping point where people realize the security features you're talking about that can be enabled even simple things like sending limits right like setting a hundred dollars sending limit on your account you could do with a smart contract wallet like those things are going to add up enough to be valuable for people to start pursuing it definitely and, and i i'm like a huge proponent of self-custody but i definitely know more people that have lost or i definitely know people have that have lost a lot more money just losing their private keys or, or so, something like that than have like lost it uh by an exchange getting hacked or something like that yeah yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess on that, on losses and stuff, are you guys pursuing any of these insurance options that are out there, almost like having like a default insurance option in case something were to happen? Yeah, we'll, we'll likely have um, a certain amount of coverage per user by default um, by the time we're out of beta. Nice. That's that's awesome. I, I think that's a, a big step. You know, I don't I don't necessarily think people want to like go seek out their own. I think kind of offering it by default and having it there built in is would be a huge step. Definitely. Yeah.
Um, so how about, you know, that's a good overview of features where you guys are at and there's a lot of cool stuff coming. What about like current app integrations? Obviously a lot of this depends on people being able to use it in dApps, you know, which ones are out there. Maybe you don't have to give a full list, but just some highlights and are you guys actively working with teams and can people still use it even if an app hasn't integrated it? Um, so, so it does require a direct integration, um, and but we're starting to see more and more uh, DApps uh, support options outside of like whatever's injected in the browser. Um, and so, you know, we launched with, you know, one, Gnosis Safe. You can go and, and create a Gnosis Safe multisig and interact with it with your Ethereum account. Um, and then also uh, we had a few other launch partners, including... Uh, OpenSea, where you can you know trade NFTs, uh, Toddle, uh, Erasure Bay uh, launched recently. You can go there and, and um, put out like a bounty for uh, different data. Uh, but yeah, th- th- there's a handful of others, and then um, like also a, a few DeFi platforms have started to add us. So you can um, use us on Idle Finance, Curve Finance, and uh, also um, Iron. Nice. And actually, I guess if so, you have Wallet Connect enabled too, right? So it's basically any app that has Ethereum or Wallet Connect. Is that right? Yeah. So you can also use it um, through Wallet Connect. And, uh, you know, you, you, with the Wallet Connect uh, experience, it, it is um, like not quite as fluid, but but definitely opens up uh, a lot of applications that, that haven't uh, directly integrated yet. So, you know, you guys are obviously building a lot of cool stuff. It sounds like you've got a lot of neat features coming down the pipeline and we'll be moving out of beta. What's kind of the best way for people to keep up with your team? And, you know, do you have, um, you know, chat rooms out there, Twitter for people to kind of keep up with the updates that you're putting out? Yeah, um, Twitter is definitely the, the best place to follow, like the latest updates and everything. Um, it's, it's just, uh, at Ethereum and, and then we also have a telegram group that, that we use. Um, that's a good place to find support. Uh, if you need to get in touch with us, um, or like you have any feature requests or, or things like that, um, the telegram group is a great place, um, to go and you can find all of that on our website, um, uh, ethereum.com. Yeah, and I, I highly suggest if you haven't checked it out, go there, go theorem.com to sign up. I think you'll be pretty blown away by how natural the login experience is, and they're paying p- for fees right now. So <laughs> go use them, and you can get free fees and check out all the cool features we've talked about. Chris, Chris, a lot for me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, it's great being on the show. Thanks for listening to Into the Ether. You can subscribe to the podcast and newsletter at ethub.substack.com, find our website at ethub.io, and follow us on Twitter at at econoar and at sassel0x.